I'm going to change the atmosphere and uh, the emphasis on this talk uh, and look at craniofacial surgery. And what I'd like to do is uh, for deformity. This is Leone. She's two months old, and she's currently on our ward in um, the Children's Hospital in Glasgow. Uh, she comes from a highly disadvantaged family. Her parents are drug addicts. Uh, she's looked after by her grandmother at the moment uh, and is, is a ward of the court. And she has uh, an undiagnosed as yet syndromic craniosynostosis. You can see she looks slightly odd. Her head shape is hugely abnormal. Head shape is hugely abnormal. And she already has the signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure. She will present a challenge in looking after her in that her care within the healthcare system will extend well beyond all the team's working lives within that are currently looking after her. And I'm going to try and discuss a couple of the aspects of care for this type of patient uh, and some of the dilemmas we face. This is her CT scan from last week. Um, and it's curious, she's got hugely open fontanelle forced open by the raised pressure. But the raised pressure has also caused multiple erosions, which you can feel when you examine her. So the pressure inside her head has caused erosions from the inside and separation of the, the, the fontanelles uh, widely. So what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is talk about some of the challenges we face, what we do, to address those challenges, why we do it, which is perhaps one of the most important aspects, uh, and how do we decide what we do. And then touch on some of the opportunities for research uh, and maybe build on some of the things that, that Simon talked about earlier. So we all want, and it's pretty obvious that we want uh, normal form and function for these children. We want to allow their brains to develop normally and their, their faces to look normal. And that's motherhood and apple pie, but let's try and look at that in a bit more detail. This is a young patient who has uh, a condition called Antley Bixler syndrome. That is not that of, of great consequence in terms of the presentation, other than that it has an incidence of one in a million. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But let's look at the problems he has. He's got a tracheostomy because his maxilla is retrognathic, uh, he's got a cleft palate, his midface is underdeveloped, and he was unable to maintain an airway. His brain is severely compromised. He's got a pansynostosis. He's got a normal-ish shaped head because all his sutures are uh, affected, and in fact, um, he didn't have the wide open fontanelle that we saw before. Uh, and that was him on the operating table for his skull vault expansion. His eyes are at risk because of his uh, extreme proptosis. You can see he's got tarsorophies here. Uh, and eye care and eye exposure problems are huge. And a, there is a significant risk of blindness as a result of corneal uh, damage. And then you can see he's in a slightly strange position uh, with multiple uh, limb flexures uh, and associated abnormalities. So the load on the healthcare system is huge, the complexity is high, and the frequency of this disease or this type of problem is extremely low. So what is a rare condition? Uh, European Commission on Public Health say that a rare condition is one that occurs in five per 10,000 of the population. So pretty much all of the craniofacial abnormalities that we see are classified as rare conditions. If one looks at craniosynostosis as a whole, the figure ranges from 2.6 to five per 10,000 live births. So they're all rare, and only a proportion of those will come to uh, surgery. So that gives us about about 500 cases of craniosynostosis a year in the UK. 
But then if we hone down onto some of the more common but rare syndromic cases, taking cruzons and aperts together, the incidence is approximately one in 165 live births, which gives us at most four cases per year in the recognized craniofacial units in, in England and probably two for us in Glasgow. So our overall caseload is minuscule. And that gives us some challenges. Are we ever going to get randomized controlled trials? Uh, the answer is no, it's obvious. Uh, we have small numbers of heterogeneous patients in which we have to make decisions that are lifelong lasting and critical. Um, so what do we rely on? We rely on personal experience and institutional experience. And I think in considering these things, we often forget the influence of institutional experience as opposed to individual experience. And it's something that I think warrants further exploration. Um, and how do we make changes in practice and, and what we do? They're essentially small incremental changes in techniques and approaches uh, that are tried in small groups of patients uh, and then adopted more widely. And I'll, I'll show you something uh, about uh, a bit later on. Uh, but let's just consider the brain and raised pressure. Um, there are, of course, in many of these conditions, they have intrinsic abnormalities of their brain which are very difficult or untreatable at the moment. Stem cell treatments may in the future uh, offer something, but there are intrinsic abnormalities that we can't address. Raised intracranial pressure is a significant problem and something that we can do something about. Um, and the eye as an extension of the brain is something that I've touched on and I'm not really going to discuss much more uh, in this presentation. So turning to raised pressure, why, can we, why do we have raised pressure? Well, CSF production could be increased, uh, CSF absorption can be decreased, but these are pretty rare in both of these both of these things for this group of patients. However, anatomical abnormalities such as Chiari's, Syrinx's, and uh, uh, third ventric, uh, ventricle problems uh, are more common, and there are some treatments for those. Uh, craniosynostosis in itself, uh, essentially constriction of the closed cranial cavity uh, leading to raised pressure is the most common cause, but there are some other things that also contribute to that. And aberrant venous drainage is now seen as a significant contributing factor, uh, along with abnormal CSF flow in the subarachnoid space. So those are the, the causes of the problem. So how can we deal with this? Well, we try and address this by increasing the compliance of the whole system. Um, uh, this is Angus, who presented uh, at the age of two with a slightly funny-shaped head. Uh, he was otherwise well and nothing really to, to be too concerned about. He was sleeping well. He had no symptoms of raised pressure. Uh, and as part of uh, the screening for his quite curious-shaped head, uh, we did a CT scan. This is a 3D reconstruction. And as you can see at the back, he, he's one of the very rare patients who has a true lambdoid synostosis. Uh, and you can see, again, these small erosions uh, suggestive of raised pressure. Ophthalmological examination was pretty much normal and behavior was normal. Uh, in our practice, we would tend not to treat an isolated uh, uh, lambdoid synostosis. Um, and we didn't really know how to deal with it. And in the end, we, we did a formal pressure monitoring. Uh, and that's his CT scan that, that demonstrates significant um, CSF spaces. And it doesn't look like he's under undue pressure. Uh, however, we did a, do a reconstruction. And he does have significant abnormal and aberrant venous drainage, the posterior part of his uh, skull here in a, a 3D reconstruction showing the abnormal venous drainage. Uh, so he came forward for pressure monitoring, and lo and behold, he was found to have uh, significant uh, raised pressure, 
uh, uh, nocturnally. Um, and here you can see we usually think about 15 as being, being normal uh, pressure. So these significant uh, peaks in pressure monitoring. But again, pressure monitoring is an invasive technique uh, and um, it does have some risks associated. So for him, we now have demonstrated uh, raised pressure um, and we're faced with, with options what to do for him. And we could either go down the shunting route and increase the compliance that way or go for a skull vault expansion. And we went for him for skull vault expansion because our philosophical approach is that the abnormality is a craniosynostosis, restricted skull growth, and not a drainage problem, and therefore we did that. Um, so we did a, a, a straightforward increasing the capacity of his skull vault, and, and that then uh, increases the compliance of the system. Uh, shunting, as I said, would have been an alternative. So this is a CT scan showing his post-op position. Um, we've increased the posterior, the, the vault of uh, volume of his skull quite considerably. You can see it's a straightforward procedure with fixed with, uh, in this case, absorbable screws and plates. Um, however, there are alternatives to this uh, and alternatives in the way that that might have been approached. And the Birmingham unit have particularly pioneered the use of uh, distraction as an alternative to the um, single, single procedure to do this. And this is an example of a small incremental change and this is uh, one of Steve Dover's cases, and I'm, I'm grateful to him for letting me have these slides. Uh, this is a syndromic patient who has the, the copper-beating appearance of raised pressure uh, with a distraction on. Um, and again, these are Steve's pictures. Um, you can see the preoperative picture on the left with a large CSF, abnormal CSF collection here, uh, and post-distraction, the shape and so on is better, but the CSF is distributed more, less pathologically. Um, so here's an example of a small incremental change in technique which will gradually diffuse through the craniofacial community. We still don't know whether distraction is better, but this is how decisions are being made now. So I'm going to turn a little bit now in the last few minutes to a, the appearance of patients and how does that affect their facial, their brain development? So there are, of course, lots of patients that we look after with abnormal faces and appearances. And it doesn't, we see it all the time in our practices, how this affects people and how this affects their development. And there is absolutely no doubt although it's not particularly well quantified or documented, how that effect is manifested. So there clearly will be effects on development. And so we try and do things for these patients. So I'm going to show you a couple of cases uh, of what we do. This is, uh, this is two brothers with Cruzon syndrome, neither of whom have raised pressure. Both have slightly abnormal appearances, which they're concerned about. Uh, the brother on the left um, has this appearance, and you can see the brother on the right, slightly less severe, but with a slightly more proptosis. Um, lateral view, this patient has slightly more uh, maxillary hypoplasia in the AP direction uh, at the lower level. And so what we did for these patients was two different operations. This is uh, preoperative. Um, patient on the left underwent a Lefort 3 osteotomy, uh, but the patient on the right underwent a, a bilateral malar osteotomy. And I think both of the results are, 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 are reasonable, but we have to use our technique and different techniques for the similar sorts of conditions and adapt it for the patient. But this type of decision is based on, as I said earlier, experience, which is individual and uh, institutional. There aren't protocols that we can use uh, to, to decide and make our decisions. So I'm going to finish up with this patient uh, who's a young man with Apert syndrome. And uh, for him, we did a Lefort 3 distraction. This was at a time uh, when commercial devices weren't available and we devised our own device. 
uh, and did a, a mid-face distraction for him at the Lafort 3 level. Uh, and I think we'll all agree that we've got a, a, a nice result at the end of this, and we've managed to cure his acne. Um, but this is a nice result probably 10 years too late. And we're faced with dilemmas as to whether to offer surgery which is less reliable and less predictable at an early age uh, with improvement in facial appearance and, and perhaps development, or to postpone it and get a better outcome at a later date. And I think these are difficult decisions for which we have inadequate data. So we don't really have significant research experience or evidence we have case reports and series, but again, they're very small and selective. Uh, we rely on our experience and judgment. And um, that gives us huge amount in the way of research opportunities. Uh, there's clinical research that can be done. Collaboration and data pooling is mandatory. Uh, we can look at functional MRI particularly, and, and Ian touched on that earlier, for, for looking at development and the effects of uh, early surgery on development and so on. And uh, there is still a huge amount of work to be done uh, in the genetic arena. So I think the N-Force has great opportunity, particularly for the small volume, uh, high complexity patients that we deal with. So I'd like to thank you for your attention in this. And before I finish, I'd like to say that there are a number of these craniofacial patients for whom, at the moment, we sadly don't have much to offer. And it's, it's important to remember that some of these patients we can't help. But there are very, very few patients that we cannot make worse. And so it's important to remember one's limitations. Uh, thank you very much.